I am really excited about this book we're reading. Who is actually picking up the book and going through it? Jason has now lost the cover to his book because he's using it so much. The cover just at some point gets in the way. Exactly what happened over the weekend. I'm like, I can't deal <laughs> with this anymore. I took it off. Mine has like water stuff down here. I won't say what it's from because it'll just make me depressed that I'm not on the beach. Um, all right. This book is, it, it's, it's so good because it really just tells you something you already know. And it, it reminds you something that you already know. And so today, what we're going to be going over is we're going to be going over actually the pieces of the framework. So we talked last time um, and we did kind of a crash course on why marketing fails and the reasons behind it. Um, and then this week, we're going to talk, we, we kind of briefly discuss what the framework looked like. Um, but this week, we're going to discuss what the framework looks like. And we're going to have some kind of time for you guys to write some of your thoughts down today. So that's what's gonna take a little bit more of the time today. And then I want you guys to be sharing what your thoughts are in those areas. Um, so what I'll do is I will share over my screen so everybody can see it and we'll start there. Um, but we're gonna go through all the pieces of the framework today. Um, and we have like about an hour to go through it. And so this will be a crash course in the book. Hopefully, for those who haven't gone and bought the book and are beginning to read it, this will make you really, really want to go buy the book and start reading it. Um, I don't have a coupon code. I'm not an influencer that is selling the book. So sorry, find someone else. Um, okay, so share the screen. I'm too excited today. So I'm not, not sharing my screen. I went to do it and then I, I didn't do it. I'm distracted by my excitement. All right, so we'll go over the marketing theme really really quick again. Um, the book of the, the month is Building a Story Brand. The script is Answer the Question, What Do You Do? So we want you guys to be building out your own script. We gave you all the resources to answer that question, the dreaded question of what do I do, where you either just say, you climb up and you say, I'm a real estate agent, which is not effective because, then you're not telling any kind of story about what you do, or you do the other thing, which we do, and you verbally vomit on them. Well, I do this and that and then and that and all the things that you do. I find myself either end and I have a hard time staying in the middle, which is, is our happy place. So last week's training for that, please go back and look at it. Um, the slides are uploaded. You can grab, grab those and go through it. Um, all of the things you need to go through that and create that question. You can go watch the, um, the actual training on the toolbox or in Facebook Live if you go search last week's video. Um, but we will continue to be going through that um, for the rest of this month. And so next week's training, Jason is going to be doing on, and I forgot to look at what we actually called it. Do you remember that, Jason? Implementing. Implementing the story brand. I don't hear you for some reason. Implementing the story. Oh, there we go. So execution. Uh, I knew it was something along those. It's, it's the implementation of what we're talking about today. So as you go through and you brainstorm the things that we talk about today, Jason's going to be talking about how to actually execute it using the tools that we have, using command, using um, the, the websites that we do have and the, the marketing that we are creating, how to implement it and how to share that story now in the real world. So getting your story in place is the first part and then how to execute that story or start telling your story to everybody. We don't wanna just leave it as an idea on the shelf, right? So that's gonna be the, the loop that we close. So the announcements that we have, um, we have market of the moment that we are working on. Advertising should be coming out for that or, our, or marketing for that should be coming out. Do you know, is it going to be out today, Krista? I know we've been working on it hard, so I don't it, know. I'm, I just did the final review on it. It looks good to go. Um, awesome. Actually, is Shannon, Shannon, are you still on here? Yep. Would you mind a couple words about it? Sure. Um, all you guys need to do is add the tag um, mom, M-O-M, -M, 
and the date. So it's 3 15 21. Um, I can throw it in the chat. Um, but you add the tag to any contact in FUB and it will initiate that smart plan, which will send out the invite and it'll create a text activity for you so that you can personally text them and invite them that way as well. Awesome. Um, we'll also have a PDF for you guys and we'll put instructions on the Facebook page. Um, but we want to get the word out on this one. So we've got about a week and a half to invite people to this Zoom. We want to have the most people we've ever had on the mark of the moment. That is the challenge. So invite your HPC leads, invite your nurturers, invite anybody who is on the fence about selling their house in this market. We are going to go over how to buy and sell in this market, strategies that are winning, um, meaning that we're going to talk about um, leasebacks, we're going to talk about knock, we're going to talk about other things that are available for people to be able to sell your house and buy your house, what the plan looks like. We'll even talk about using something like pods as an alternative, using a, VR, a VRBO or an Airbnb for a transitional time and what some of those costs look like because we're talking about actual clients that have done this and what their story looked like. We'll talk about looking at a rental, all the different things that we can do and put together. And then we're going to send them back to you, the experts or the guides. See what I did there? We're gonna send them back to their guides for a plan that could work for them. So um, invite your people. It's easy conversation to have. If they're, they're thinking about selling this year, they should be on this Zoom call. Um, new agents. We have three new agents that are two have joined and one is in the process and just joined the brokerage that we're at in Midvale. And so we're excited to have her coming on. Um, I don't think we have them on right now. I need to look at, at what we've got. I can't see everybody when I'm sharing my screen. It's too small. So the new agents, um, they're all in Utah. Um, I just, it's from my trip when I went up to Utah and um, was talking to agents up there. So we have um, two more network agents and one is joining the team up there um, or investigating the team, but it's almost a done deal. Um, so the names are Stacy, Chris, or not Chris. Um, I just, Braden. <laughs> Bradley. Bradley, that's, it's the worst. Um, so Bradley Taylor, I lost it there. Um, and then Mary. So those are the three that will be joining and you will be interacting with them coming soon. They're awesome. All three of them have different stories of why they're here in real estate and where they've come from. Um, Stacy's been in the industry for years and years. Um, and uh, Bradley is a newer agent um, up in the South Layton office. And then um, Mary will be in the Midvale office in Salt Lake. And she has been um, about, about three years is how long she's been an agent. So we're kind of, we have a long-term, kind of a, a medium and then a little bit shorter. So we're excited to have them joining on and jumping into the, um, the Zoom trainings and, and kind of getting you guys to know them. Um, also the 66 day challenge continues. So just wanna make sure that you guys are aware of that. And here's some updated numbers. Kathy is killing it. She has grown her lead. She wants that, that commission split reduction. That is for sure. Uh, Blake is pulling up second. And Marla closed the gap on Blake in second place at 169 and Veronica is hanging in there at 99. But um, Marla's still in the butt kick position or the kick in the pants position. So she's trying to move out of that position, right? <laughs> All right. Now I get to, to start what I'm really excited to talk about. So building your script. This is the part that can get tricky, guys, because this is where the rubber meets the road. This is where you are getting into the analysis. And so one of the things that I wanna warn you about is don't get in your head, stay in your heart in this. Because if you get in your head, you're dead. You're gonna analyze, you're gonna overanalyze and you're gonna keep analyzing and you will never create the script. But if you could sit down for an hour and even just time block an hour after this time 
um, after the training and just say, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to do my script. I'm going to, I'm going to write out each one of these and I'll have the, the slides shared right afterwards. You can take your notes right now and write it all out, but take the time to do this. If you need to go download the book, re-listen to stuff and, and um, buy it and then read it, whatever you need to do to understand this, it is essential because when I said all we're doing is, all the book does is kind of remind you of things you already know, it's true. We're all living a story. And when you guys think about yourselves in your life, each one of us is the character, the, the protagonist, the hero in the story that we're living. And that is true across the board. So when anybody you're speaking with, they are living their own story. And Regardless of, of how you think about it and, and what you're doing, you're always taking it through that lens. And so when we're, when we're talking to people, we need to talk to them through the lens they view the world. And that's all the book's trying to say. We talk about this in, in um, Keller Williams all the time when we talk about talking to people in their disc. That's the same idea that speaking to people how they like to be spoken to, right? Well, this is taking it to another level and talking to their life story. And so that's why it's such a cool book and such a cool thing to be looking through. So I want to do a quick reminder on why marketing fails. The number one mistake was that businesses fail to focus on the aspects of their offer that will help people survive. Remember Manslow's hierarchy? And it's just science has proven. Science has proven that people are looking for things that will help them survive and thrive. So if our marketing is focusing on things that don't help them survive and it's too much noise, then the second part comes in, the second mistake. We have all this knowledge and what we'll tend to do with that curse of knowledge is we'll verbally vomit in our marketing. We'll say all the details. We'll tell them all the things without focusing on what's actually going to help our clients with their problem or what they're struggling with. And so if we do that, it's just noise. And you guys, you guys are aware what noise looks like in your, your news feeds on social media, in your junk mail. It's stuff that you, you throw away and you tune it out. We talked a little bit about how um, your brain subconsciously weeds those things out. Because, I mean, I can see in my peripheral, on both sides of my face, all the way out to here where I can see my hands, right? You guys can't even see it on the screen. But when I'm, if I was, if I was always seeing all of this stuff at all the time, then I would get distracted really easily. And so my brain helps kind of weed all that stuff out unless I need to see a car that's kind of screaming in on my peripheral or something like that. Um, the other day I was driving and this is just another, another example of it. And I couldn't really remember, I was driving home from the gym and I couldn't really remember the lights changing or the only thing I remember driving home was I remember that there was a cop who had a speed trap set up and I looked down to check my speed. Do you guys ever had that happen? That's, that's your subconscious drowning out that noise to what's really important. And what was really important to me was not getting that ticket. And so it's interesting that this drive that I do every day, that's the only thing that I really remembered. And I was safe still because our subconscious keeps us safe and keeps us you know, not hitting the car in front of us. But that's how it works. And that's how our clients work. If our marketing is too much noise, too much information, the result will be having your message get ignored. So I just wanted to remind you those, those two things. Um, we need to focus on what's gonna help them survive and also make sure that it's simplified such that there's not too much noise in the message. All right, any questions on those mistakes before I move on? As the reminder, awesome. I'm not watching the chat, so sorry, I didn't have it open. If there's anything in there, I need to be aware. Of. Don't worry, Chris, I'm watching the chat for you. Awesome. Okay. My only thing is if we're burning too many calories with too much information, I don't know why I'm skinnier, not skinnier. Because <laughs> you're overloaded with the information these days. All Shut right. up, Krista. I'm just going to say that right now. You are skinny. <laughs> I'm not going to hear it. We'll, we'll have that conversation offline. 
All right, here's the framework. I'm gonna remind you guys about the framework and then we're gonna go through each one. So, the hero. This is every single movie that you ever watch, right? Except for the ones that fail because they didn't follow the framework. And if they don't follow the framework, then people lose attention. So, the hero. Let's talk about a movie that we wanna use in the, as an example. Should we use Star Wars? The Hobbit? What do we want to use? Hunger Games? Silence of the Lambs. We're not using Silence of the Lambs again. <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> Run with Star Wars. I think most people on here understand that one. All right. So we have Luke, right? Luke is the character in that story. And Luke has a problem. What's Luke's problem in the, the movie? What causes the drama? He doesn't know who his father is. Right. <laughs> I've never he, seen that. So I that's a big part of the problem is he doesn't <laughs> know, you know, he has a, he has an understanding. He's an orphan and he's with his aunt and uncle on this world. And all of a sudden his, his life's kind of interrupted. I love Cheryl, daddy issues. Oh, great. Bevy hasn't even seen Star Wars. That's it, Bevy. Now you got to go watch Star Wars. All right. So Luke has this problem. Um, and he, he feels like there's something inside of him that needs to be discovered. And, and he has this kind of internal conflict, right, of being more than what he is. And um, so someone shows up at this, like, planet. Who shows up there? Obi-Wan Kenobi shows up. A guide. And what is Obi-Wan Kenobi's, like, position in the movie? He teaches, we have all the background he on him. He teaches him how to lightsaber and he teaches the force. That's right. He is a Jedi. And so he already has been through the training and he actually trained Luke's father, Anakin Skywalker, right? And so throughout the whole like kind of next part of, of the, the training, um, Obi-Wan Kenobi becomes the authority on being a Jedi. And then there's another guy that shows up as well. Um, it's not limited to just one. Who's his other guy throughout the movie? Yoda. He meets Yoda, one of our favorite loved guides in the whole wide world, unless you've never seen the movies and you don't care. All right. So he, he meets Obi-Wan Kenobi. And what does Obi-Wan Kenobi give Luke? He gives him directions. He gives him a plan, right? He starts training him. He starts teaching him. And he, he starts helping him with things. And then what does he do? To, what does he do with those tools? He exhorts him to action. He, he sends him to Yoda to do more training. And they, they together tell him that, you know, harness your feelings, all your emotions and everything to control the force and let it go through you and all those things, right? And they actually then start building him to exhort him to do those things, do the plan, follow the training. And that, that leads Luke to becoming a Jedi. And then following their, their training kind of comes into, it could result in one of two things, right? What are kind of Luke's choice once he's gone through the plan? The dark side or the good or the side? Rebellion. Yeah, what do they call the good side? The rebellion. Yeah, that's who they are, but like the are. dark side or the the force. force. Is it just the force? Yep. All right. That's okay. <laughs> so he's sitting there, and that's that's his story, right? He's got to choose which way he goes, and there's a lot of drama and things put in there. There's there's a villain in the in the mix, which is Vader, um, which is kind of his dark past because it's what his father is and has become, and it's like this is foreshadowing what Luke could become, right? And so in the end, he has to choose and he chooses success. The rebellion wins. They blow up the Death Star twice because once isn't enough. And that's the, that's the script. And it's, it's the same script if we went through the Hunger Games, if we went through the Lord of the Rings, all the stories follow this line. And any romantic comedy, you'll see the same thing um, that goes through this. So it's essential that we understand this script because if we use this, 
then it helps people to fall in line with what we're trying to tell them. So they're going to fill in pieces for us of message, the message that we're sending. And by them filling in the pieces, we're using a framework that they're, they're comfortable with. They will actually fill in some of the holes for themselves and tell the story to themselves. That's part of the secret of the story brand. All right, so let's break it down. The hero, the character in the story. Agents often make themselves the hero of their message. Why is that a mistake? We talked a little bit about this last time. Because it's not about us, it's about our clients. So what's an example? That's exactly right. And if, if they think that we're the hero of the story, that may not be some a story they want to join in on, right? Because everybody's living their own story. So if, if that's an example of a mistake, what does it look like in practice? When you take credit and talk about I, 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 instead of my clients. You yeah. don't make them first and foremost. I just got all these awards. I just got this, I got that, I got that. And, and in doing that, is that, is it a bad thing to talk about those things? No, and what do those things do? They actually mm -hmm. build credibility, right? But if we're coming from it, from a narrative of I'm the hero, then we lose their attention. And that's what we're seeking to keep. We're seeking to keep that attention that they have on us and in that story. We want them to see us as the guide, as the one that they want to use as the guide. So if, if, the, if they're the hero of their own story, let's think about our clients and what does our hero want? Obviously, it can, it can depend on, on which client we're talking about, right? But on, on a general level, what do our clients want as the hero in their story? They want to hear the story as it pertains to the client and what the client ended up getting. Like, like the seller's goal was to close in 30 days. So um, not necessarily the price. So the story behind that, I would think, would be then um, how maybe we as agents guided them in the review of the offers and then left it to them to make the choice on which one was best for them, but kept the client in the center of that explanation and the discussion and not talk about how I advise them this, I advise them that, but more so explaining it in the reverse. Is that what you're saying? Yes, that's kind of going through the whole process a little bit. So a little bit more than what I was asking in a, a real estate transaction that we're, we're actually, let's assume that our clients are going through a real estate transaction and that's the story. What do they want? I feel like they what want is, to be the what boss. The client want? They want to be in charge, have control maybe. Okay. That could they be. want to feel heard. They want to feel heard. Okay. There's want if security. We were, security for sure. Like that could be a piece of it. This is what I want you to do. I want you guys to brainstorm this question. I want you to keep it and write, what do your clients want? And you need to answer that question because if, if you don't know what they're looking for, I think what, what clients are looking for, a good way of figuring that out is what are clients complaining about in the industry? Where do they where do they find problems in a transaction? So if we go through that and we're looking at what we got some noise going on. Not sure which one it is. Oh, there it is. Cheryl Hatter's gone. Okay, so one of the things that we look at when we're trying to decide what clients want generally in a transaction. Which control, opportunity, options, like all those things. Um, the perfect home, not competing with 40 other buyers is probably what they want. Um, there's, there's lots of things that we can kind of create as that story um, of what they're wanting or, or talking about. 
we've looked at in the past, we've looked at the top complaints made about real estate agents and NRA, NAR, not NRA, NA, our National Real Estate Association. So NRA, and not, is that right? I'm just like tripping with now, like the, anyway, you guys know, you guys know what I'm talking about. Um, National Association of there it is because I keep wanting to say real estate first. NAR. NAR. NAR does a survey every single year checking on um, what the top complaints about agents were or what people complained about in their transaction. And usually in the top two is lack of communication and I didn't know what was going on. So that dictates like it shows that a main concern that they may have is they want to know how things are going to happen. They want to, they want information. Um, that may be a big thing that they want, but putting like, what do they want? They want the perfect home. Like that may be exactly what they want and they want to live. They want to have a different circumstance. They, they're, they have a life change. Some, something is happening and you can have a different story or you could be talking to a different client or character as a seller. You could have a story like script for them. And you could have a story script for buyers as well. And then you could have a generic one. So don't limit it to, I can only have one script, one script for sellers, one script for buyers. There, there's lots of, of ways that this can go through as well as one for investors. What does an investor really want? They want a great like investment opportunity, right? Or they, they want to see investment opportunities coming across their desk daily or something like that. So we want to make sure that we're talking to what they're wanting and we're, we're focusing on them as the hero. So does that make sense? The difference between you being the hero and them being the hero? I'm gonna assume it does. All right, so next comes down to the problem. And one of the things that, that we've, I've always kind of shied away from is like scaring people into working with me. You guys, you guys ever like kind of worry about that? If I focus on all the negative things that could happen, um, that I may be like a little bit of manipulation to them to get them to work with me. Am I the only person that's ever felt that way? Like I know something that they're doing that could be wrong, but I don't want to like tell them because it just sounds like I'm telling them that because I want them to work with me. Anybody ever felt that? Krista yeah. raised her hand, but. That is, is something that I think we can be very careful about when we're describing the problem. And I think it's important to understand three types of problems that people are dealing with. And the first type of problem is an external problem. And I wrote down a, a example of that. I need to find a new house, right? That's an external problem. The internal problem that they may not talk about or tell you about is that I'm very confused and a bit scared. Maybe I'm scared that I won't find a house. Maybe I'm scared I won't qualify for a house. There's lots of internal things that we can be confused about. And that's an internal problem, not an external. You guys see the difference there? Or they, they use the example in the book of um, a rental car situation. And they, they give the example of um, people not wanting to go into the, the rental car place and have long conversations when they're on these business trips, they just wanna get in, they've just had a long flight, grab their car and go. And so the, the external problem is I need a rental car, right? The internal problem that people were feeling and that one car, I think it was national, um, kind of went through and started marketing to was the internal problem of, I really don't wanna be talking to people. I just wanna go, if I could just walk straight to my car, get in and drive away, that would be the best situation. And so they did a whole ad campaign on you're tired. All you want to do is jump in your car. And they just show people like getting in the car, walking through the airport, getting in the car, sitting down and like taking like exhaling and then driving away, like with a smile on their face while other people like walking past lines of other people in the, the lines for the cars and things like that. And that's, they were speaking to or, or marketing to their message was for that internal problem that people were facing of being tired, not wanting to go through the lines and all that stuff um, at the car place. Um, CarMax did the same thing for working with a used car salesman, right? They spoke to not, you need a car and started advertising all their cars. They actually, they spoke to the problem, the internal problem that maybe other car dealerships didn't want to, which was 
you don't have to deal with the used car salesman here. So that's an internal problem versus an external. I need a car, don't market the car, market the experience that people were struggling with. Does that make a difference to you guys in, in understanding that, the difference between the external and the internal problem? We need to speak to our client's internal problem and we need to define it for them. We have to understand what that internal problem is. So in the book, it goes through these, these problems and the last one being philosophical. If you can solve their internal problem and their external problem, and then you can give them an answer to a philosophical problem, you're gaining, you're likely going to be the solution that they choose. So um, with that philosophical problem, let's talk about what are some of the, the philosophical problems that people can have that we could solve. I just used one, I want a home that is environmentally friendly. Like the external problem is I need a home. Um, I'm confused about everything. And there's a deeper kind of seated desire that I wanna be environmentally conscious. And so I wanna find a home that is energy efficient, that has all the different things that, that are now being put in. I want solar, I want all these things in, in place. Um, but the first problem being, I need to, that internal problem being, I'm just confused and I don't have the information or the resources I need to find out more. So those are the, the three types of questions. What's another philosophical um, kind of solution we could give to people in the housing market? do you think that would, would come into play? How about in the beginning when they're just interviewing you? Like, how do I, I mean, they all have fears about choosing the right agent. Mm -hmm. What does an experience look like when you're having that conversation with them? Like, um, you know, how, how would you maybe give us an example of how you would come across with an experience that would make them, you know, kind of go, oh, I like that. Yeah, I think I think there's I think what it takes is is in that consultation. I don't think you try to come with a story in place. The story that you've already told in your marketing, you can go through some of that and, and I'll show you at the end how to gain how to create your story again and again and then have more examples. And that comes down to reviews and and stories that you can tell about successes where you're highlighting your clients. Um, but I think what we can get to when we're meeting with people, Kathy, is asking the right questions to understand these three problems they're facing, if they have them, right? So asking them, you know, we do good, I think we do great on the external problems of what do they need? What are they like their needs and wants for a house or when they're selling, what are their needs and wants, timeframes, things like that, right? I don't think you guys have any problem getting to that external problem of what their need is. I think what we go deeper into in the internal problem, and Jason says this all the time, that people's what doesn't always match their why, right? So if, we, if we're doing that and we stop short of really finding out why or what's driving their decision or what's, what fears are driving their situation, what anxieties they might have about the process, if we don't dive into that, which those are are a little bit more challenging. Those are a little bit scarier to dive into, right? To get a little bit more personal, to get, to get into that relationship with them. We have to ask questions like, is there anything you're worried about during the transaction? You know, that's a good question. Or what, what things are you worried about? Or what, what are you, what's a really good way to say this? What do you believe is too good to be true or something to that effect where you're trying to ask them, you know, they're hoping for this, but they're, they're damping down their, their desires because they're worried that they can't have it. Right. So getting maybe to that say, kind of, go ahead. Maybe say like, um, are there any concerns that you want to go over that I can help with? Yeah. You know, I like, think, so it's, it's not yeah, like great. sounding bad. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I, I think that you want to you want to make it open ended. Obviously, um, are there any are there any concerns or are there any questions I haven't answered um, that you may have? Asking about former experiences is a really good way to get to that that internal problem or internal conflict that they may be having. Um, and asking more details for the philosophical, you're just asking um, what's important to you in the, in a house that you're you're looking at. 
Um, like you're then getting into other features that aren't necessarily three beds, two bath, pool, like asking why is that important to you when they're, when they're saying something that they want so that you can understand that philosophical thing a little bit more. Um, so can I ask a question? Yeah, please. Would, would, would asking them a question um, in trying to dig deep to find the internal piece um, what if you were to ask them a question? Um, so, okay, in, in buying a home or in selling a home, what would be your perfect, um, what, if you could picture what that would look like uh, from start to finish for you, um, what would that look like? And maybe have them describe what they think it should look like and maybe what they really want it to look like and kind of figure out where the gaps are and then go in that direction. Yeah, I think that's right along the way that, that you want to kind of go with it. Um, remember, what you're trying to do and, and take the time to identify what you see as your clients, because you guys have had conversation with clients before. You can kind of identify these three things um, if you went through it. And if you can't, when you've met with someone and you still feel like you don't have their external, internal, and philosophical kind of problems they're dealing with, then go deeper with them go a little bit more and, and follow up with them. Hey, it was great to have that conversation consultation with you. I just had a couple follow-ups as I'm doing your search. You said this, now go into it a little bit more. If you feel like you don't have answers to these because this is something that you need to have answers for. Um, and then what you're doing is you're going to use these examples and these, these internal conflicts to speak to the message in your plan, which is the next slide. Hey, Chris, real quick, and yeah, maybe this is too simple, but one of the things I've learned in my marketing class, the best thing when you're like talking to someone trying to learn more is after you've asked the question and they, you know, give you an answer, you go, tell me more about that. Like, yeah. tell me more is the easiest way to invite someone, like for them to safely feel like they can actually keep going and not give the bare minimum. So there might be less chance of having to revisit, not saying that it's bad to revisit and follow up because I think that's good too, but I'm just saying like, I, I think it is one of the best small phrases is tell me more about that. Yeah, it's a perfect phrase. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, using that phrase, they say go three deep in your questions, right? So once you've asked the initial question, ask them again and then ask them again. And that way you're gonna get, you're gonna uncover things and they're gonna feel, feel a little bit more free to be able to express those things. So tell me a little bit more about that is a great way to get them to open up a little bit more and maybe unpeel it for themselves. Because a lot of times our clients, they're, they haven't gone through this process themselves to analyze what their problems are. These are a lot of times unconscious things that they're, they're worried about. And they may have the worry, but they haven't placed them in, in an organized fashion. And so speaking through it and, and talking with you that can help them to flesh these things out to understand what they really want out of the transaction. Does that make sense, guys? Yep. Awesome. So I skipped that. I skipped this step. Meets the guide. So this is this is where we get to shine. Is we get to be the guide in their their transaction. And we talk a lot about this when we say we want to educate, empower, and entertain. Right. This is a big part of working with people. And if we think of our job as educating people, empowering them, and, and when we say entertain, we think of engaging them, right? So if those are the three things that we're looking to do, then this is how we can actually start to create that trust as a guide. So how do we position ourselves as the guide? We need to have empathy and we need to show up with authority. So what, does, what do those two things like show up as? when we're talking with our clients. Obviously, I've, I've put my thoughts in there as trust and competence to create that empathy. What we're looking to do when we have that empathy with their, their internal and external problems is we're looking to have empathy for it. Does that mean that you have to be as environmentally conscious as them to have empathy for their desire to have a, a really green house, right? We don't, but we can have empathy for it, right? Um, there's, there's a lot of that going, going throughout the transaction. It may be that you've never had a problem with your credit or you've never had a problem making payments or something like that, but you can have empathy for their struggle or their worry about qualifying for the loan. There's, there's lots of pieces in there where we can show up as someone that they can trust. 
having those questions like that you just said, like, tell me more about that. That creates a little bit more space for them to be vulnerable and to trust you a little bit more. And when you show up with empathy about that, instead of saying, oh, that's crazy. Why would you ever want that? You don't want that. Like, that's how we can show up as not empathetic, right? So what are some other things that, that we can, other ways we can create that empathy um, within the transaction or within our marketing? Any thoughts on that? All right. As the guide, we want to make sure that they are able to trust their information with us. And that's a, a huge part of the transaction. And we talk about this again and again, people work with who they know, like, and trust. And so that's a, a big piece of this final kind of like, I'm gonna sign to work with you over all these other, other options because they know they like us and they trust us. And people, people like people when they can actually tell their story. And I, I find this all the time that when I'm doing the talking with the salesperson and they've asked the right questions, I start to trust that person better and more as the, the conversation goes on, even though I'm the one doing the talking. Many times as the guide, we think we have to tell them everything and we have to help them to see all the things that they need to see. And really what we need to do is we need to guide them. We don't need to tell them everything that they need to do or make all their life decisions for them. We just need to give nudges and nudges come with questions to understand them. Does that make sense? That's another way of having that empathy is letting them talk through those things and helping them organize their thoughts. So how do we show up with authority? I think it's just either having an example to relate with the empathy or uh, like of how you did it in the past or basically saying how you would or going to take care of it in the future. Yeah, I think uh. that it's kind of the next step, which is talking about the plan that you have. One of the things that they talk about in the book is they talk about testimonials to develop authority and competence because nobody wants to work with a guide who just says, Oh, I don't know. I've never done that. Let's try it, right? That doesn't breed confidence or that, that authority. So what we need to do to develop that authority is we need to speak in a way that people can understand that we've done this before. We have the experience. And one of the best ways to do that is to highlight other people and let them talk about it. Talk about how we showed up as their guide. Talk about how they got a better result with us than they could have gotten on their own. And that's always what I talk about. There's no reason to have a guide if they don't know something that you don't know or they, they haven't been through it before, right? Otherwise, you, you might as well just do it yourself because you're just kind of both figuring it out at the same time. Does that make sense? The only reason to have the guide is if they've, they've been through it before and they know something you don't. So what I want you guys to do is take the note of meets a guide and understand, who understands their fear Talk about how you can show up with empathy. What are some things that you can do? What are maybe some statements that can show empathy for the problems and the character that we talked about? And how do you show up with authority? Do you have some, some testimonials you can highlight and you can show of clients in the past that you've helped through some of the problems that your clients may be facing now? In external, internal, and philosophical. Don't just talk to external problems. That's where we fall into that trap of, um, talking about, I sold their house above list price, da, 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 da. And this helped them because, does that make sense? Now you're talking to, because they got a job transfer and they were so worried about not being able to, to find the, a buyer in time, not being able to find a house that they'd love in their new place because you, you talk about that problem that they were facing and the internal conflict that they might have had. And you get from, I did all these great things, we helped them and they, they were able to make these great decisions and they got the result that they wanted. That's important because, and then you speak to what the internal problem was because other people might be, 
oh my gosh, I just got news that I need to do a job transfer. And now I don't know who to talk to. And this sounds like they got a really great result. So I'm excited. And I'm going to go talk to Blake about it, or I'm going to talk to Kathy or Cheryl or so, 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 right? If we speak to that next level of problem, that internal problem, because this is important because then we can talk through that. That's the empathy piece that we're, we're helping other people see that we understood why. And we're building that trust and confidence for them. Any questions on that one? On, the, on how to show up with, with empathy and authority? You guys are already experts at it, so. All right, gives them a plan. Um, I have something I wanted to say that would be maybe a good example of that real quick. Awesome. Say, say I mean, <laughs> for right now, I mean, COVID, right? So at the beginning of COVID, um, it, me in particular, I had a client that was concerned, how are we gonna sell because of COVID and all the restrictions? And if you, like in my case, were successfully able to do that, and here you are a year later, we're still dealing with COVID, maybe their fear is, am I gonna have enough buyers? Am I gonna have enough clients? Or um, how are we gonna handle this around COVID? And, maybe explaining how you were successful in handling it on another would compare to their fear about COVID and how they would navigate through that now? Is that is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, I think that you have to decide if the COVID fear is still a present fear for them. Um, but yeah, that's exactly right. You're showing how someone else went through it, how you helped them, and it, it just gives them an example that you know what you're doing, here's the path, and then you're able to lay it out and summarize your plan, which is kind of the next step. This is what I'll do for you. This is how we can, like, this is the plan. Does that make sense? You can use the example and that adds credibility to your plan's success. Got it. So it all kind of works together. But you have to make sure that it's still something that's a fear for people or, or a problem that they're facing. Um, and there's enough fear out there. There's enough problems out in the market right now. Um, you don't need to be worried about being a fear monger because there's enough there to, to worry about, right? People have enough things going on in their lives that it makes, it makes things harder as hard enough as it is. You don't have to make up something else. You don't have to pretend or like foreshadow that there's going to be a crash coming. So do something now. We don't, we don't need to talk about that. There are, some people use that strategy of fear mongering, like do something now because this is the problem that's going to happen. We need to use real problems that people are actually facing. And so, you know, COVID may still be on, on a lot of people's minds. It may be tough. Some people don't care anymore. And they, they've experienced it. They've had COVID and they may not, it may not be their biggest problem now, um, internal, external, philosophical. So just be aware of that. And when you're looking, it's a good example. Could be a story for some people. Um, they're not universal when we're going deeper into exact examples. Does that make sense? All right, so gives them the guide gives them a plan. So here's what I want you to do is I want you to summarize your plan for your clients. And can you summarize it? Like that's, that's one of the things that I want you to, to answer that question. Do you know what your plan is? And this is how it should look. There's four simple steps to sell your home. And then you need to say, those four steps are dip, 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 right? Or there's a foolproof five point marketing plan to blow buyers away. Like these are just examples of how you can condense it and simplify it. If, if you give people five you know, screens of text about how you're gonna sell their home, how much of that do you think they're gonna read? We have like the, the attention span of a goldfish, right? Less than that now with all the data that we're going through. Remember, too much noise is too much noise and they'll, they'll weed it all out. So when you're looking at this and you're summarizing your plan and you're writing it down, try to put it into bullet points, try to put it into steps, try to put it into something that they can be like, that sounds simple. Because we know for sure it's not gonna be that simple but there's a lot of things that they don't need to worry about because that is some of the things we take care of in the transaction, right? So if, if we can take those off the plate and we're able to just speak to the simple steps we can help them to do, they just need to do this, do this, do this, and then we'll have that done. 
that, that then gives them something to follow. If the plan's too complicated, they'll move on to find a simpler plan. So try to summarize your plan, try to think about what you're, you're talking about as, as your steps. Look at the team stuff that we have on, on you know, we, we put out a flow chart that's pretty simple as far as going through what the steps look like. There's lots of different like resources you have, but when you're talking about your plan and what you do, you wanna know exactly what your, your plan looks like and what you're giving to people because that's what they're buying. They're buying that plan. They'll, they'll look at your plan if they believe that you're someone who's trustworthy and competent. But when they get to the plan, it needs to be something that is simple and efficient to get them to the end. And they need to be able to visualize that in their mind. Too much, they won't go through with it. Does that make sense? Cool beans. Next one, call to action. All right, so this is taught pretty clearly in the MREA, uh, Millionaire Real Estate Agent Book. So what, what we do a lot of times is we'll get people, we'll tell testimonials, we'll do all the things that we need to do, and we won't tell them to do something. We won't exhort them to action. And um, they actually, in the book, they give the example of um, tele, not telemarketers, they give the example of the TV salespeople and they're like, call now, call now, call now. And he's all, the reason that they're speaking with so much urgency is they're trying to wake people up to action. Now, we don't need to be as um, overt, maybe, as, as the TV salespeople um, when they're like, buy on TV, buy now, buy now, buy now. But what we do is we need to let people know how to act. Because we need to instruct them. Here's the plan to get started, call me here, right? That's, that's that immediate thing to be able to contact now. Contact us and this will happen. Or download, like there's two different types of calls to action. There's the direct call or direct call to action and then there's the transitional. So can you guys think, I mean, I've given examples, but in, in giving the call now or the buy now button, how those affect you versus the transitional, which is read more, subscribe, or download. Do you guys see how those, those play out differently in your marketing and where you could put those in? Where would it be better to have a transitional call to action versus a direct call to action? Isn't that what we do with our Facebook ads where we say for more information, fill out the form? Yeah, for sure. That one's more of a, it depends on what the, the actual message is. But if we're saying download or subscribe, right? Subscribe to my neighborhood alerts or if they're asking for, you know, specific information about the, the property, one property, that may be a call me now to get more information, right? That may be more of a direct call to action. Does that make sense? So in they both have places. So asking people to come to the market of the moment, which we'll have another update about because we have a conflict. But um, that may be something where it's there, the person's not ready to do anything yet and we want to just get more into relationship with them. That's what those transitional messages are for or transitional call to actions are for is to get people to, to come closer to you to, to get into relationship with you further. Does that make sense? Where <clears throat> the call now, we want that in front of people who want to sell now, who want to buy right now. Um, and we always want that to be available for them to call us, to buy something, to act. And so, that's what I want you guys to look at when you're, you're kind of trying to develop your script is think about you being the guide, think about your plan and give them the, the call to action on what they need to do. So if you had in your marketing a four steps to selling your home for the hot, like top dollar, you may wanna have like a download now as your transitional or call me to learn more, right? There's two different types of, of um, call to action you can have there. So go through that. Think about how you can have a direct call to action and what that looks like. 
to invite people to act and then the transitional to invite them to get more into relationship with you. All right. Oh, I left two there. So the result. Once you have gone through and you're able to speak to your client as the hero, you've identified the problems, you've introduced yourself as the guide, and you have the plan given to them, um, you've called them to action, this is, this is how we can have our, our end story here. People who do this or follow the plan, this is kind of how you finish your story, right? People who have followed the plan result in this success. People who have come to me afterwards and they've kind of done their own thing have this result. And you're, you're showing like what the, the difference is there. And you can speak to their problems still, right? So Sally and John came to me with this problem. They chose a different agent and their house sold for this or this happened, or they came to me after their house had been on the market for a year and they weren't able to sell it. So they came back to me and we were able to have this result. This is where we talk about, you know, the things that could happen if people didn't make the right choices in a transaction. Right now, I have three different clients in, that have been clients of you guys in some form or fashion that are worried about disclosure issues for cases. I'm writing two demand letters um, for clients, um, two sellers who have didn't disclose things on a transaction properly. That's an issue, that could be something. Um, there's, there's lots of different things that could result in tragic results in a transaction. And we can say, these are things that could happen that are, are, are really something you, want, you don't ever wanna have to deal with. Um, having buyers fall out, having appraisal issues right now, right? Like making, making sure that people understand the challenges of the market right now and what happens when you fall into those challenges, the result. They lost their buyer because the buyer, they chose a buyer that gave them the highest offer but didn't waive appraisal. Something along those lines, right? The appraisal came in low and now there was an argument about that. There, it's easy to talk about tragic results then they couldn't buy the house. They lost the dream house that they we'd gotten them under contract with because they couldn't close on time, right? Like that's a tragic result for someone who's looking to buy a home and sell a home at the same time. We, we don't have to make these things up. We have clients that have experienced those types of things. We can go through it. And there's people in our agents in our market centers that have had problems like this. We can talk about those and, and address them so that people know there is value in choosing my plan, right? Not everybody has the same plan as me. And that's what sets you apart from your competition is one, that you're speaking to them this way. And two, that you've actually identified the results that they'll get versus working with you versus working with other people in the market. Does that make sense? Then what we wanna do from that, if you guys can write these down, what are the successful results to that client that you're talking about that could happen? And what are the tragic results that could happen if they didn't follow your plan? Let's say they just decided to be a for sale by owner or something, right? Talk about what that looks like. All right, transformation. This is our success stories. This is the thing that is our responsibility as agents to gather. Um, this, is, this is the social proof for yourself. This is the evidence that your plan works. So you take what your client needed what they wanted, all their fears, the problems that they expressed at the beginning and the outset. And then you talk about, so the from, and then you talk about where they're at now. And you can, you can write that story for them and you, you have them authenticate it. Take a quick video with them. Like Jason's gonna talk about some of these execution points that you can do to get your story out there. But this is where you wanna identify, here's their from, here's where they were, when I first met with them, when I first talked to them on the phone, when they first filled out something online to talk to me, and here's where they are today after we got everything done that they wanted to have done. Writing that social proof gives credibility to your plan. Does that make sense? And it lets people put themselves into other people's positions. 
oh yeah, I was worried about selling my house and not being able to find another house. It looks like they were able to do it. That means I can do it. So I'm going to call them. Those are the things that we do is, and, and they, they say, I need a guide too. I need someone who knows this stuff. And I want to accomplish the same thing that that person did. Do you guys ever feel yourself like, why do you think they show us models in clothes, right? They don't just show us the clothes. Because I want to look like that, right? They, this is, they're telling a story every single time they're, they're having someone wear something, they're putting them out on a beach, they're doing stuff. It's not just, here's some clothes on a rack. They tell a story with the clothes that they're selling. Instagram, any of the things that they're doing now, they're telling a story, right? They're showing the product being used. They're showing other people use it. They're showing how it fixes problems that people are facing. If you, if you go through and you decide and you, you just want to look today, be awake to what's happening today and, and how the marketing looks to you, look at the things that, that, that stand out to you and see where the story is identify the story because a lot of those people, a lot of those marketing products and, and things that are happening are following this script. Does that make sense? Okay. Jason's been texting us. Jason, I don't know if he's still on or not, but I didn't read the sure text. Am. I just saw that we do have a conflict. So do you want to talk? Do we want to try to move it to Wednesday? What do we want to try to, we'll need to, maybe we want to talk offline, but the 25th is actually the awards gala for KWEV, which both Jason and I will be at. I hadn't put that together yet. So we will, we'll either do it, we'll have to look at the calendar and see what we want to do. Um, would a Wednesday be better for you guys or would a like Friday morning be better to invite clients to maybe a Wednesday evening or a Friday morning. Most of my contacts work regular office hours, so I don't think the morning would work. I agree. Evening or is Wednesday better. Wednesday evening. All right. We will look at what that Wednesday evening looks like to try and do it the 24th, not the 25th and see if we can get some things changed for that. And we will let everybody know on that conflict. Cool. We'll get you more information. Hopefully guys, this was valuable for you. And I'm gonna post the slides up right underneath the video training for this um, on Facebook so that you guys will have the same slides that I just went through and be able to go through them, answer the questions. I invite you as your guide today to use this plan to create your script. Do it now while it's fresh in your mind. Don't take, you know, think you're gonna come back to it, fall into that myth that, you know, I'll do it later because later usually doesn't happen for stuff like this. So go download the slides, go through each one of these, answer the questions that it's asking you. Even if you just get all your notes kind of and your thoughts in your head from what you've had as you've kind of gone through this, it's worth it to do it now and do it today. That way you'll have it. You'll have questions for Jason on how to implement this. I've got my story. Now what's the best way to implement this next Tuesday? Jason's gonna go over it. He'll talk about the channels, using which channels are best, how to do it, which medium's best, video, if it might be better in writing, whatever it is. Where best to have your, your testimonials posted to gain that, that trust. All those different things we'll go over next Tuesday. Um, so that'll kind of pull everything together for you from what we've been talking about. So if you don't have it by then, you'll be behind and then you'll be, you'll be trying to scramble to catch up. So go through it today when it's fresh in your mind and get that done. Any questions, comments? Cool. All right, guys, thank you so much. Um, I will have the slides posted shortly. Thank you. You're very welcome. We will talk to you all later. Bye. Okay, the vacuum cleaner has stopped momentarily. They
they hit the router and kicked me out of the meeting. <laughs> so I, I I could I heard it uh, like a the boom, and then I'm like I hear a whole bunch of Spanish just. Da, 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 da. I'm like, that's what happened. <laughs> so anyway, um, Jason, we had this on the calendar before yours, so I'm just gonna say that right now. Mm, yeah, <laughs> we had ours. Uh, we were all, we we had saved a date twenty fifth, twenty seventh. So it's okay. We'll we'll live. We'll live. All right. So we're looking at new calendaring. Oh, hey, Chris, you want to cut this off? We're supporting. <laughs>